In this video, I'm going to discuss what happened to the company Jimboree. So if you don't know, Jimboree was a retail company that sold children's clothing. They also owned the Crazy 8 chain of stores and Janie and Jack. And they competed with companies like Children's Place, Carter's, which makes Oshkosh Bagosh, and then also big box stores like Walmart and Target, which also happen to sell a lot of children's clothing. Now, Jimboree went bankrupt the final time in 2019 and a lot of people blamed an earlier leverage buyout by Bain Capital which left the company with a lot of debt and made it really hard to be able to make the interest payments and so I want to walk through from an accounting perspective we're gonna look at some accounting metrics and try and understand was it actually that leverage buyout by Bain Capital that sank Jimboree or was Jimboree in trouble before that even happened okay so let's let's take a look first I want to walk you through a timeline just to make sure you understand all the the key points here so Jimboree was started in 1976 it went public in 1993 Bain took over the company as part of that LBO leverage buyout in 2010 I'm not going to go into the details of what a leverage buyout is, but if you don't know, I just want to give you the basics. So Bain paid $1.8 billion to acquire Jimboree, but two-thirds of that, so about $1.2 billion, was debt. And Jimboree ended up taking that debt. That's how a leverage buyout works. So Jimboree went from having almost no debt at all prior to 2010 to all of a sudden having $1.2 billion worth of debt. Okay. So then they're, inc they're incurring a lot of interest and so forth, but we'll get to that in a second. So now in 2017, they ended up declaring bankruptcy. They closed about 300 stores and they were able to get rid of $900 million of debt. Okay, So they were, they were able to get rid of most of the debt that they'd taken on in the LBO, but they still had debt. And just in 2019, they ended up going bankrupt as a second and final time. And at that point, when they went bankrupt the second time, they still owed their creditors about $200 million, and they owed about $12 million to their suppliers. Uh, but by the end, I mean, they, they were even having issues getting uh, inventory from their suppliers. Their suppliers didn't want to give them credit because they didn't think they were going to ever get the money and, and so forth. And so the second time when they went bankrupt, uh, they decided that the company was done. They were going to shut down all the Jimboree stores, and they were going to shut down Crazy 8, and they are going to try and sell Janie and Jack. So that's a story. Let's get into the details, particularly with this leverage buyout by Bain Capital. And let's try and understand what it was that actually killed uh, Jimboree. Why did this company go under? So let's take a look at their operating profit. If you see their operating profit, it was in 2007. So this is prior. So 2010 is when Bain ended up taking over. So in 2007, we, we, these numbers are in thousands, by the way. So we've got $130 million of operating profit. So this is a profitable company. And actually, we see an upward trend in the operating profit. But then it starts to go down in 2010. And then by 2013 and 2014, the company is losing money. You say they're losing money. Now, let's take a look at the interest expense. Because remember, interest expense is a non-operating item. So that's not going to be factored into operating profit. You're going to take operating profit, then you're going to subtract things like interest expense, which are non-operating items. You're going to get to earnings before income taxes, then you're going to have tax expense and net income. So why do I have the interest expense here? I want to show you what happened right here. So let's take a look at this. So we went from having almost no debt, so very little interest expense, 240000 or 243000 in fiscal year 2009 for Jimboree to 91 million so that's an increase of more than 350 times more interest expense after Bain Capital took over so it's a substantial increase in the amount of interest expense uh, for, for Jim Burry now if you look their operating profit in 2010 was only 153 million 91 million right there if, if you could, if you're to subtract that almost all the operating profit is going away and you see in two, fiscal year 2011 the amount of interest expense actually exceeds the operating profit. So at that point, the company is definitely going to be losing money because they're, they're, you've got here our operating profit is before interest expense and other non-operating items. That if interest expense is eating up all the operating profit, that spells trouble for Jim Burry. Basically, if they don't have any profits, how are they going to be able to invest in the stores and so forth? Now, you'll see, if you take a look at their working capital, 
and I got this from their 10K, uh, their SEC filings, if you're curious. So now we start here in 2007. So that's prior to so 2010, but when Bain Capital took over. So we see that they're actually their working capital was going up. So, so their working capital was going up over time. But then we see that this trend downward after Bain Capital took over. And you know, working capital is very important to the company being able to make payroll and so forth. And we see there wasn't really much of a problem. So this is suggesting, this is lending credibility to the argument from a lot of people who say, hey, it was this leverage buyout that really killed Jim Barry because Jim Barry was on an upward trend. And then after Bain Capital took over, they just didn't have money they didn't have money to update their stores and, and so forth and and here's another way of looking at it you could take the, the cash flow to capex ratio that's a ratio of a company's cash flow from operating activities which you get from their statement of cash flow uh to the capital expenditures which you also which would be in the investing section of the statement of cash flow and th this is a, a cash outflow capex okay so if we were to look and let's start back here at 2007 and we look at the, the cash flow to CapEx, we see 1.57, it actually goes up 2.76 to 4.46 prior to the LBO, right? Prior to the bank capital getting involved. So it's going up. What does that mean? Who cares? Well, when the cash flow to CapEx was high, that means the company has a lot of cash flow from operating activities, which it can use to spend on capital expenditures. And you say, why is it important to spend on capital expenditures? What are we talking about? We're talking about updating Jim Barry's stores to make sure they're clean and so forth. And, uh, and then also, what about building an online platform? Jim Barry did not even have an app. Okay, so a lot of our companies were shifting to being able to say, hey, we need to build an, an e-commerce platform. For example, the Children's Place, which is one of the competitors th th that I mentioned before for Jimbery, they invested in building an online platform to be able to increase the amount of online sales they were having. Jimbery was not able to make any of these investments during this time here because you see that, that it starts to drop off their cash flow from operating activities. A actually, when... You see that uh, around here, when bank capital took over, they actually did do some more capital expenditures. And you'll see that uh, it went up from 1.46 to 2.50. They actually increased the number of stores, but they didn't invest a lot in, in upgrading their existing stores. Or again, that online platform. I probably don't have to explain to you the importance of having an e-commerce platform during this time period. And they just didn't generate enough cash flow from operations uh, to be able to spend on capital expenditures. So the company was strapped for cash. And you can see that right here. So again, we got 2007. So this is prior uh, to the, uh, the leverage buyout in 2010. We see that the company's cash was going up and they seem to be doing fine. Okay, they had a, uh, they had a good amount of money. They had $250 million. Again, this number is in thousands. So they had $250 million of cash in 2009. But then look what happens after the leverage buyout. So again, this is supporting the argument that it was the leverage buyout. So bank capital took over and basically Jim Barry did not, it was all they could do just to pay the interest. They just didn't have enough money to be able to invest in their stores or building an e-commerce platform because they were trying to service the debt. Uh, this is the same issue with Toys R Us. A lot of people criticize Bain Capital and say, hey, look, basically Toys R Us, uh, they, they had $400 million a year in interest expense, and so they couldn't make any investments because they were stuck spending whatever profits they had uh, to, to service the debt and pay interest. And so that's the argument saying that it was a leverage buyout that killed Jim Barry. But let's take a look at some other uh, performance metrics. For example, if we look at Jim Barry's sales per square foot, and so here's 2007 and here's 2015. So we look at the sales per square foot is actually, so 595 in 2007, but look, it's going down. It's going down in 2010 is when Bain Capital went over or took over. And it was going down before that. So there was a downward trend. Sales per square foot is a good measure of how, how well a retailer is making use of its space. So this was downward trend before Bain Capital took over. Now, it continues downward after that. Certainly having a lot of interest and so forth and not being able to invest in the source, that certainly didn't make the problem uh, any easier to solve for Jim Barry. But if we also look, for example, sales per store, we can take a look at that. So 
and, and this is not in thousands, by the way. This this number here is not in thousands. So we had in 2007, we had about 1.2 million dollars in sales for a typical Jimbery store, but then that was declining. That was declining, and right here, 2010, it's, a, it's basically a little less than a million. It was about 990 thousand per store. So there's a significant decline before bank capital took over. So the Jim Jimbery was on a downward trend. There were some things that were going well for Jimbery. We saw that the working capital had been increasing. They had operating profit. It was a profitable company. But I'm just saying there were some key performance indicators here that were trending downward before Bain Capital took over. Now, if we look at same store sales growth, Okay, so that's just thinking about organic growth. It's a, it, remember, any company can increase its revenue by just saying, oh, let's open more stores. But we're just saying, look, at stores that were in place from the beginning of the year, did they have an increase in sales or a decrease? And we see that in 2007, there was a 7% increase in same store sales growth. Now, th this excludes online, uh, these figures here. So 7% increase in same store sales growth, which is great which is great for a retailer, but then in 2008, 0%. Now, you can understand, we know that we had the, the financial crisis uh, during that time, the Great Recession in the United States. So it makes sense that these metrics would not be great during that time. Part of it was uh, the economy and so forth. We can't just lay it all at, at poor management and blame Jim Burry, right? So the economy was doing great in 2007, 2008 and 2009 we had a financial crisis so that that is explaining part of this but even so even so it had been pitched that the great thing about Jimbery was that it was a recession proof company and that's why Bain Capital was excited about it so because people said well even if there's recession people are still going to buy clothes for their children well the the data here don't seem to bear that out because we see that they had no growth here and then actually a decline in 2009. Now, 2010, the decline, there's still a decline, but not as bad as, and so forth. And, and it appears to be making a comeback in 2011, but again, we get back to a downward trend. So my point is this, Jim Barry had several disturbing things that were happening prior to Bain Capital taking over in 2010. That doesn't mean that Jim Barry was definitely going to go under because, again, we had a recession happening during that time, although that wasn't te technically supposed to affect the buying of children's clothes. We know that some parents might say, okay, well, we'll start doing more hand-me-downs or we'll buy used clothing or stuff for the kids and so forth. So clearly, there was a downward trend prior to Bain Capital taking over. However, that being said, it is possible that uh, Jim Barry could have made some kind of a comeback after the financial crisis was over. And that's because we look at the companies like, again, the Children's Place. The Children's Place was doing all right during that time. And so there are other companies, there are other competitors that did well, and Jim Barry was not able to recover. So in the final analysis, it looks like Jim Barry had some problems. Jim Barry had some disturbing issues. Uh, prior to bank capital taking over. However, when we look at the amount of interest that, it, and it, for example, when we look at, okay, they actually have the interest expense is exceeding the amount of operating profit. It's like, okay, whatever profit Jim Barry was generating from their operations, it was eat, being eaten up by interest expense that didn't leave Jim Barry any money to be able to invest in, in the business and try and be able to kickstart that growth and get back to the kind of growth that they had prior to the Great Recession.